Welcome to the show, Eric. How are you, sir? I am very good, Guru. Thank you very much for having me on. I would love to start with a quick introduction. My name is Eric Murrell. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of GenoSkin. We're a Franco-American biotech company based in Toulouse, France, and for the past three years, also a lab in Salem, Massachusetts. Love it. Do you want to tell a little bit about you? What is your background? How you ended up as a teacher? Sure. And so I am a virologist by training. I uh, did through my master's in France, and then I came to the U.S. to do a PhD. And I then shifted to roles in biotech and worked for companies of all sorts of different sizes. And more, a lot of my work was in functional genomics and in research tools. So coming to, to GenoSkin kind of checked a lot of boxes. It was a Franco-American company. I was a French guy based in the U.S. for the past uh, 25 years. I was uh, really passionate about accelerating science and generating tools, platforms to catalyze really getting to develop drugs faster. So it was a good fit. And I think it took just a couple of days between the, the, the first call and uh, the actual meeting. I was uh, living in St. Louis at the time. The first call with Pascal, the CEO, who's based here in the U.S. as well. And mm -hmm. the meeting, I think we met two days later, I flew over to Boston and said, you know what, I can just come and let's just have a real conversation and see if it goes anywhere. And the rest is history. I've been with the company for about three years. Very cool. Do you want to double click on your background a little bit? So I went for a PhD in molecular cell biology. It was at Boston College. Mm -hmm. So here in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. And I focused on papillomavirus. So mm -hmm. I looked at the transport mechanisms of the virus within the cells and what caused cells to transform. So turn into to tumor cells. Very so cool. That was uh, my focus. And by the time I was finishing the PhD, I had two children and it was time to get a job. While I was doing doctoral work, I had taken also a lot of interest in business function. I was taking classes in public relations, in business, and, and that's why I ended up taking my first job. I moved to Pittsburgh to work for Fisher Scientific. Mm -hmm. I was part of their life science uh, group. So out of headquarters. Very cool. And your role was mainly the business development. It was a sales, yeah, it was a sales job. It was a, you have a territory, you've got a very large catalog of products. I focused on mostly genomics related type offerings, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was a, it was a basic sales job. And so I kind of, I had done jobs growing up, to kind of help with the finances, but that was my first real job. And uh, I, I learned uh, a lot. Right. I think in sales role, they say, if you see most of the profile of uh, most of the successful CEOs, CXOs, they all have some background in marketing and sales because you learn how to influence people. And scientific uh, selling is uh, more complicated because you are dealing with people who are trained to question things, right? Right. So, so being, being credible is already hard enough. You don't have to try to be incredible, just be credible and trustworthy. So when you say things, that's why a, a lot of my time is more spent listening than talking. Love it. It's now while Fisher Scientific was a more of a transactional role on the portfolio that I was taking care of, it did require more consultative type approach. And, and as I moved along in my career, that those are some of the skills that I sharpened and took on more and more responsibility and uh, was, was fortunate to be involved in some very interesting uh, projects. Yeah. And so what is your learning so far as more of a commercial guy, commercial leader in the life science space? Like how do you think sales, uh, selling, influencing people is different and especially knowledge-based industry compared to let's say you are selling something or marketing something in the consumer space? How do you think is different? So I think that the in any type of sales, it's important to listen to the customers mm -hmm. and uh, what their needs are. Um, but in science sales, uh, you also have to be able to be an educator right. and uh, to very much understand what you do. Uh, what the company you represent does because you have to be able to be an ambassador for that. And you may have to explain to someone uh, 
which is very well educated what your product does and and be able to stand your ground on it uh to not be you will be challenged but to be able to be confident in what you're going to say so uh what i look for in in uh team members that are going to be on the sales side is really people who one can listen two can educate and um and do so with confidence and so i was not a skin guy even though i can say well i've been an, an expert in skin for 47 years just because i've had a skin but mm -hmm. my expertise in skin beyond reading some papers prior to joining geno skin has been really learning a lot from every talented person on the team and reading publications and and keeping myself uh, abreast of what what the industry does now we don't just do skin for skin so it's it's somewhat misleading sometimes for people when they think when they see what we do but so it's it's important to be able to have people who usually have also that scientific training on the team even though it may not be a subject that is exactly the subject that we deal with they have that mindset of questioning things trying to understand so that to explain it 100 percent, because uh, you have to speak in the same language if you are selling scientific product obviously you have to understand the science behind it like what will be the impact how it is different from competitors so it does help if you have a uh, good scientific background. And to know when you don't have the answer, where to get it. That's really key. No, makes sense. Makes sense. So I would love to learn more about GenoSkin. So what is your elevator pitch for the company? Uh, my, my, uh, so, so my elevator pitch is uh, that uh, we have uh, developed transformative technologies based on living immunocompetent and injectable skin uh to accelerate primary data generation uh in order to uh, um really um de-risk uh, both therapeutic and non-therapeutic development mm -hmm. and do you want to talk more about the type of products or custom products you offer sure so we were um we we've evolved actually over the the past uh we're a 10 year old company we'll be mm -hmm. celebrating our 10th anniversary in october nice. and um we we evolved a lot uh in the past three years first we we developed the 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 lab in the us uh that was a big uh, a big move the ceo decided to really bring the the dna of the company here he moved here with his family mm -hmm. uh, that's when i joined as well and uh, to set up a lab, not just a commercial office, but um, it, with that whole perspective of being credible and being able to support a market, uh, it was needed to be present in this market, right. not just present with a sales office. And so we also at that same time launched uh, a platform called Hyposkin in which we were finally able to um, maintain the hypodermis, the adipose tissue, the, the fat layer uh, under the skin, uh, and to maintain it uh, in such a way that we could sustain injections. Mm -hmm. And we developed IP on it, uh, and it is the world's first and only injectable platform of a human being. So that really changed also who we were working with the legacy business was dermo cosmetics there was mm -hmm. a lot of pressure in europe for um shying away from animal testing and being able to, to find alternatives there and, and um our focus and the the engine really of our growth in the us quickly became biotech and pharma because mm -hmm. the alternative to uh, injecting in an animal where the attrition rate is about 85, 90%, uh, the, the alternative is taking a risk in a human being. Mm -hmm. And we are that bridge. So we can, and, and I mentioned sometimes the, the idea of uh, being a true first in human, because first in human is when you do that first step in a, a full human being, it's a phase one clinical trial. Um, 
you can actually generate that same level of data on our platforms. Now, not for all of it. We only have one piece of the puzzle, but the skin is one of our largest organs. It's the biggest barrier to our environment. It's a mandatory test organ for toxicity. Right. So that phase one is about toxicity. Now we probably could say, because we also do efficacy, immunogenicity when it comes to vaccines. So we're more, we can go all the way up to what would equate to phase 2A. And actually we were, we were invited by FDA at the end of 2019, Yeah, Pascal and I to train um, reviewers from CEDAR. So, and we went there, they wanted to see what was possible with the models, what were the limits. And we are a very active R&D uh, company. Mm -hmm. So we focus on going beyond those limits. We, in the past three years, have launched um, a platform that's also connected to microfluidics. It's mm -hmm. called FlowSkin, in which you reproduce a circulation. Mm -hmm. So we connect it and we can then do PKPD. Uh, we launched a vaccine platform because we have all the immune, immune cells uh, resident to the tissue. So we can see the first steps of vaccination within the tissue as well. Um, we recently launched actually uh, also our injection site reaction platform where we do a very deep characterization of the crosstalk and the presence, the proliferation, uh, the activity of immune cells within the tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, from antigen presenting cells to dendritic cells to um, to T cells, and the, um, uh, we're able to spatially localize them and follow their function. Great. So you talked about a couple of uh, possible use cases: talked about vaccine platform, flow scan, hypo scan. That probably a yeah. few. Years ago. Do you want to double click of any of these models and their use cases? Hey. One, one that captures a lot of things today. And they all, so when you look at the different technologies, HypoSkin enables injections. Mm -hmm. Once you do an injection, you can look at injection site reactions. And a particular type of injection site reactions, when you look at also how it triggers immune cells, can be the vaccine platform. So it all is very much linked. And the injection site reaction platform is really a very interesting one because it can be based not only on the ex vivo platform. So we maintain human skin in a survival state, in a functional survival state. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we look at what happens upon injection in the tissue, we can see different things happening depending on the compounds, formulations that are tested. And for biologics, one of the reactions that can be as simple as just an erythema or redness of the skin, or as more dramatic as a full anaphylactic shock are those injection site reactions that are based on some of the triggering of immune cells. Mm -hmm. of which one of the, the main cells involved in, in injection site reactions are the, the mast cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, one particular receptor on those cells is called the MRGPRX2 receptor. That receptor is at the root cause of a lot of those cells that degranulate, that explode, release uh, um, gra their granules within the tissue and are going to result in all these problems that one sees. All biologics have at some level or another an injection site reaction. Mm -hmm. The key for a lot of people is understanding it, understanding what the reactions are going to be, and then seeing how you can modulate those reactions. Can you change the formulation slightly? And so what we've developed is in addition to the ex vivo platform, We've developed also methods to maintain primary mastocytes in culture. So we mm -hmm. derive them from PBMCs and it takes three months to, for us to obtain a population of primary mastocytes that have all the characteristics of the mastocytes that you would have in the tissue. But then we can look at just those mastocytes separate from the whole system. We can also isolate that particular receptor that I was talking about, the MRGPRX2 receptor. And we can look at that in cell lines. And so we have an approach where we're really 
drilling down to understand the pathways of everything that's happening within the tissue. And then we can image that, do spatial omics, add RNA-seq to it. And then suddenly we have a very deep characterization of what happens in human. Sounds great. And you talked about vaccine platform. Did you get a yeah. chance to support any COVID-19 uh, candidate? So or vaccine. Well, I can't, I can't uh, talk about the proprietary work that we do for customers. Uh, we have a vaccine platform mm -hmm. and we have tested vaccines for COVID on our platform. Very cool. We have tested other types of vaccines as well, but we have tested vaccines for uh, anti-COVID on our platform. Very cool. Like what type of vaccine? Like mRNA? <laughs> Uh, that I unfortunately cannot give you more details, oh, but uh, I can tell you that we have tested more than one vaccine. Love it. What is a business model? You are selling more, you're more so towards the shelf. Today, today, the majority of our um, business relationships are um, our platforms. Okay. And, uh, for our product line, which for a long time, for seven years, was really the, the driver of our business. Mm -hmm. Um, our product line now is, uh, is all available online and mm -hmm. people can, can uh, order that very, very easily online and then get their products uh, for them. Now that doesn't come with our expertise and uh, um, really uh, not only conclusions, but recommendations. And so a lot of people talk about um, CROs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not the one that coined the, the term I'm about to say, but we see ourselves more as a PRO first, because to be a pro sounds really good. Yeah. And um, we're a partner research organization. So people come to us because they have a, uh, a challenge. They have a problem. And whether they are a big company or a small company, really, we work with some of the largest companies and, and we work with virtual companies that just raised funds uh, or want to raise funds and uh, want to generate some, uh, some human data. Because when you think of what we're able to do within the confines of this is not a full human being, but this is not emulating data. Right. This is not predicting in any way. This is generating primary human data. And that's why I talk about true first in human. It is not cell lines. It is an actual functional organ. It's not an organoid. And so that shift in, in our business model, people come to us with projects, questions about their compounds, whether it's a device or a compound, whether it's a biological or a small molecule. We work with people who create drugs that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a dose and people who just make toilet paper. Right, right. There's, it's really, we, we run a pretty big gamut there. And so I'd say that 80% of our revenue today comes from the research partnerships though. And you mentioned even virtual companies work with you as a partner, big mm -hmm. pharma, bigger companies work with you. So yeah. what stage they generally come to you? You see work, mainly safety work just before clinical trial. So, so traditionally it was all, we fit kind of in this preclinical, right? Mm -hmm. There's a embargo on the news that's coming out in, in July. So I'm not sure when this discussion will, will happen, but sometime in July will be some news about one of our partners that actually comes out on July 25th, but the embargo is until July 2nd. Mm -hmm. So we have one of our partners who took a molecule out of phase one. Mm -hmm. and came to us because of concerns in injection site reaction. We worked with them to screen different variants of the formulation in order to identify one in which we didn't have as much, actually we had a very significant drop in degranulation of the mastocytes. Mm -hmm. This was data that they could not obtain on other platforms. And so that's where our business model is. And, and in terms of the types of companies that work with us, they can be publicly traded, very large companies. This morning I was speaking to a three-person company. And, and this is where our, our strength is, is that we make a full-on scientific proposal. Everything is line item. So 
we try to future proof as much as we can the experimental phase so that we can think of many different analytics that we could do. Another big advantage of our platform that you will never be able to do in clinic uh, is the fact that you can do in the same donor multiple different tests. And when I talk about this partner where uh, we were able to determine a formulation that uh, was not causing injection site reactions, we could test in the same human being all the different conditions. That's something that you cannot do uh, in clinical trials. Yeah. So yeah. I think that, um, and, and to look at clinical uh, development or drug development as it is today, we've got preclinical phase one, 2A, 2B, 3, 4, uh, and then it's released on, on the market. Um, the I truly think, and it will not be with only GenoSkin, it will have mm -hmm. to have more actors, mm -hmm. but uh, I truly believe that um, the future of drug development will not take any risks in humans. When mm. it will get to humans, it will be just a final validation. And mm. that we will be able to, uh, and this is not 100 years out. This, the, at the pace we're going, and if we learned anything uh, of last year, is that uh, we can develop things faster. Right. And um, we need to. Drug development should not take 15 years. And we can bring it to a level where there is no risk in a human being. It is only a human validation, the last step. But between AI, between um, platforms such as ours um, and, and other platforms that are developing today, uh, we can generate the data necessary to prove that it works in a human, to prove that it's safe in a human, Mm -hmm. And then it's just that final check. It was done in a human, but without any risk. I think that's where we're going. And when I met with FDA and I also had the opportunity to meet with EMA, they said, don't get stuck with the different phases. This will change. It has to change. Animal work just doesn't work. And one out of 10 work. Right. Uh, the cost, I was reading an article that was published initially in, in or it was, it was a publication, a scientific publication that came out in 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the data out of that publication has been used by different marketing firms, but it estimated the cost of non-reproducibility of animal work, of preclinical work uh, in the US alone to be $28 billion. Wow. So there's a lot of money at stake. There was recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a company that was uh, announcing uh, that they were doing a fundraising of $95 million. Three days later, they were saying, well, the FDA just shut down our phase one and we're not closing the $95 million. This $28 billion, this $28 billion loss is exclusively because of irreproducibility in animal work or it, every it's yeah, it's, it's a lack of reproducibility uh, of clinical trials. Got it. Okay, it's because of... Uh... Uh, preclinical, sorry, of preclinical. So it's the known reproducibility in once you hit the clinical trials. Got it. That's what we're uh, you just can't reproduce that, that data generated in preclinical. Right. Annual and... cost estimated at $28 billion. Like, wh why? I'll like... send you the reference. Sure. What do you think is the reason behind that? Is it... Uh, I think well, I think that the the animal issue is one. The attrition rate of work done on animals. Just if you look, sure, we have four limbs. We've got we're warm blooded. They're mammals. Even if you look at non-human primates, they're very close to us, but they're just not us. Hundred percent. I yeah. I I was reading. The immune system is different. Yeah. The, the structure of the skin can sometimes be completely different. Right, right. And so to say that what you generate in an animal model is going to work, I think what you can determine the best in an animal model, and, and that from an ethical standpoint, we take a big stand on it. We do not do any animal work. We don't use any animal products. The, the best thing you can find in an animal is, will it kill it? Yeah. And yeah. if it kills it, you probably shouldn't try it in a human. Right, right. 
But the rest, it's a little bit like buying all of the lottery tickets and said that and saying that you won the lottery. Yeah, but you bought all of the lottery tickets. Right. One given ticket isn't really the statistics of it being a winning ticket or low. Right. No, I, I was reading some, I think it was a Nature article, and, and the title was like, mouse is a mouse is a mouse. End of the day, it is a mouse, right? It's not any, it's not human. So I have plenty of, of people who tell me, well, I'd like to reproduce the data that I got in this mouse. And my answer is, are you developing a drug for a mouse? Yeah. Then let's develop data on a human. Right. But do you think FDA will, or are they even accepting any safety data on animal alternatives at the moment? To my knowledge, they have already. So I think there's a company, I believe it is called SimCyp. Okay. I think it's S-I-M-C-Y-P. They're owned by a company called Sertara, C-E-R-T-A-R-A. Um, and I believe that SimSip has been able to get an IND approved. So going from preclinical to clinical based solely on AI data. Wow. Now, the funny thing about AI data is that it's only intelligent because you feed it information. Mm -hmm. You can have a great algorithm. If you don't feed it info, it's not going to be a great algorithm. Right. So the there still is a need for data. How right. do you generate it? And so that's why I'm saying we can't be the only solution. Right, because- uh... It will take multiple different types of companies and, and we are also developing, adding things, complexifying the characterizations, complexifying the data that we can generate so that we move towards not only the, the data generation, but better data, more data generation so that we get closer and closer to that point where it's just a validation in human. Got it. So it looks like you have some consulting element in your offering because you mentioned detailed scientific yep. proposals and yep. uh, my assumption is correct. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we don't separate it from actual work. It is included with us designing experiments designing study plans, spending a lot of time with, I have with a major pharmaceutical customer, I have a weekly call, which includes also our chief scientific officer and also a study director where we exchange on where the research is going to go. And that's why I'm talking about being a research partner. And some people talk about becoming extensions of their labs. Sure. We do it on contract, but we're truly research partners in that sense. And Science doesn't always go in the direction that you expect. And it's our responsibility to guide on how we can best help catalyze our partner's work. Yeah. And so cons consulting element is there. So your platform based business model, your off the shelf product. So today it's about 80% of our business is uh, the platforms and 20% okay. is the, the products. Okay. And do you have any uh, data analytics offering as well? So you are making prediction, not just based on the data you generate, but also like, do you have in the back end some historic, historical data? Of not, millions today. Of not today. So today it is, well, it's not done in a structured way. Okay. So that will be uh, one of our future moves. Got it. Because, so, because there is, we, we are a tremendous uh, source of potential data, even if it's, anonymized, de-identified in some way, the power of that amount of data that we generate uh, is, is strong. Um, uh, we have one of the largest uh, uh, sourcing networks, both in the US for the US lab and the, uh, in France for the French lab um, of tissue. We work very closely with surgeons. Uh, we develop the, the, the we stabilize the, the skin within 12 hours of a surgical procedure. This mm -hmm. is the logistics of an organ transplant. Yeah. Because yeah. this is, it stays live. The patient is alive and the patient's tissue organ is alive in our labs. Yeah. Are you doing any bioprinting uh, as well? Like, are you printing 
So um, I'll, I'll answer it maybe in a cryptic way. Uh, the, the, if we had uh, our dream list of what we could have, mm -hmm. we would have a full human being. But ethically, that's kind of challenging. So um, right now we have, well, we started, we just had two of the layers of the skin. Then suddenly we had three layers. Uh, then suddenly we're connecting, uh, we're injecting. Um, so I said we're a very active R&D uh, company. Uh, we are definitely looking at going beyond the, the today's limits of what we have. Love it. And I think there are two ways. One is sorry to, to make it cryptic. <laughs> no, no, no. It, 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 I, I, I understand what you're saying. So there are two ways, right, to really recapitulate the human disease condition. One, you create own human being, which is ethically, morally, is controversial, right? Yeah. Other is you have all the data points probably billions of data points, all the variables, and you create in silico uh, version of human to recapitulate all the possible. Right. And that's why I'm saying that we may not be the only piece of the puzzle. We can't be the only piece of the puzzle. 100%. So I think we have to... And so there will be all these pieces of the puzzles. There yeah. may be an integration at the end, maybe the future of, of uh, regulatory bodies such as FDA is to be that integrator. Yeah where they get all of the data, they are the integrator that then says, okay, we have enough, we're confident, final human validation, we're done. Right, right. Yeah. And what are your thoughts? Maybe about we'll grow to be that, that company that collates everything. I don't know. Right, no, this is super exciting, but currently because data is all over the place, right? Even companies that are generating data or hospitals, the pharma companies running clinical trials. So there's no centralized way to even structure the data properly. So we are arguably not learning from our previous mistakes and argu arguably we are not creating a better human replicas with all the data we are generating. So how we can possibly reach that, that promised land is probably through a marriage between different fields so you and i know that there there are companies out there of which ours which are starting to talk on how we can all work together right right so because it does require some pre-competitive uh, collaboration more and more yeah well, I, I think the future is super super promising in this uh, space do you have any patent on your technology like what is the IP here? So we do have IP. The initial IP was how do we stabilize skin? So the idea in itself is very simple, right? There are two, uh, two ways of having skin or, or um, reconstituted skin. In our case, it's not reconstituted, but our idea was very simple, is mm -hmm. how do we leverage what nature has made? Right. And what otherwise would be destroyed. At the end of a surgery, that sample is getting destroyed and we're kind of flipping it and we're like no don't throw it away it's it's an invaluable we know how to keep it alive it's invaluable source of data right so um our first patent was how do we prepare stabilize the tissue in such a way that it can stay in this functional survival state for an extended period of time because right. otherwise the skin will start uh, degrading very quickly, 24, 48 hours. Yeah, yeah. So that was our first uh, patent. And I believe um, that was uh, at the, in the early days of our company. Since then we've had uh, an active IP um, effort. And so the injectable uh, model, that's an IP that's been uh, filed. Uh, the flow skin model, that's uh, also IP. The injection site uh, reaction platform, where not only do we take the, um, the ex vivo, but we also add on to it mm -hmm. with complementary assays. That's an IP that we filed as well. So, um, and that one is filed, it's not yet granted. But uh, that one is, uh, the rest has been granted already. Got so it. it's, it's important. I mean, and that's why people come to us because 
we have not only that IP, but we have that know-how and experience. They are experts at, in their compounds. But right. one of the first questions I ask is, do you know what you expect to see? And when they have no human data, and that they're just driving something, we know in cell lines what it does. Okay, you can make a cell line say anything you want. Right. So let's see what it really does in a human being. And so we're seeing a lot of partners also that come to us with repositioned drugs, repositioned compounds. This has anti-inflammatory activity. All right, can we use it in your psoriasis model? So that's another IP we have. We developed a 17TH1 uh, platform. So a psoriasis-like inflamed tissue that takes three mm -hmm. days to get the tissue to, to have the same properties as you would have in a psoriasis patient. Right, right. We developed that with Leo Pharma and it's been used by many, uh, many customers to date. Great. And when you say, let's generate, let's see like how the human, I'm paraphrasing, how it will perform in human if it's a repurposed drug. So what do you, what is the desired outcome here? So when companies come to you, they are like, is your sweet spot doing efficacy testing or more comparable studies for repurposed drug, bioavailability? Oh. Like, is the sweet spot because okay. the safety. sweet spot today is in immunomodulation and in efficacy. So we're very, we very much have a focus and expertise in immunology. That makes sense. So and because the, we really, the fact that we're able to maintain the tissue as an immunocompetent tissue, albeit we're not recruiting more immune cells today. I measure my words as I say today. We're, we have uh, on any given 40 micron slide, probably 800 immune cells in there wow. okay. that are all cross-talking. Immune cells tend to leave the biopsy after 24 hours. Here we, we keep them really encased in the biopsy and they keep doing their thing. Love it. And who will you consider your closest competitor? Because there are many players creating human on a chip. So yep. arguably they are also, um, so people human. who are, yeah. So, and, it, and it's interesting, right? Because I said, we're not emulating. Yeah. So, um, a lot of people are, are emulating those organoids are, uh, they're, they're reproduced structures. We didn't reinvent the structure. We developed technology to maintain the normal structure, to maintain all of the cells that are in the tissue. So it's a different approach, right? We didn't reinvent the wheel. Like, oh, the wheel exists. Great, let's use it. But how, how do you even get so, whole body experience to your model? Uh, well, I completely understand that argument. And I say, but, but nobody is today. Right. Nobody has the whole body. So that's right. why I'm also saying maybe to get to that whole body, it will take many companies getting the pieces of the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, that sounds a little bit like a Frankenstein story, but the, the, uh, the, if we each have a piece of that puzzle, we can, um, we, we can find those answers. And so to, to ask who our competitors are today, our competitors are, well, all of the animal work. Okay. We see it as a competitor because people go to them for, and then there are some major companies, right? And I don't need to mention their names, but there are some major companies that do animal work. Right. Even those companies, if you look at their acquisitions they're doing today, yeah, they're buying insurance because they know that animal work uh, is going to come to an end. So do you think we will replace animal testing with more ethical, more... Economy. Absolutely. Not only do I believe that we'll make it, we really have a moral obligation to do it. 100%. Yeah. Uh, we have a moral obligation to develop drugs, better drugs, in a faster way, all while maintaining a safe way of doing them. Right. And that's, that's, uh, that's really my motivation. I know it's our company's motivation. Uh, and, uh, we can get there. We're not, we're humble enough to know that we can't do it alone, right. but it is our responsibility as the biotech and pharma industry 
to be able to support those drug developments in a better way. So what type of timeline we are talking about? Five years, 10 years, <laughs> 15 years? When do, I have a, do I have a crystal ball? If I did, I'd... I, um, well, EPA has said end of animal testing, uh, 2035. Okay. So it's slowly coming, right? It's like slowly coming. Um, it started off with the, uh, the cosmetics industry. Right. It started off in Europe. That's how we came to be as a company. There's a lot of companies that work on skin, uh, out of France where we, where we were born. Uh, and, um, it, that pressure extended to Asia, mm -hmm. actually, as of May 1st, China, even for, uh, for a certain category of cosmetics now, um, uh, does not require animals. They required animal testing before that. Right. No, I heard that. And in the U S I think we're up to seven states of which California uh, for cosmetics products cannot be tested or made with animal products. But California being the eighth economy in the world, suddenly that means no one in the U.S. is going to do it. Right, right. Um, so it is the future. Um, when it'll happen, if you want me to put a date on it, I'll put a date on it. Let's do it. I'll say 2050. I want to see it. I want to still be alive and see it. Okay. Well, that's not a bad... 20, 2050 gives us 25 years. When I see what we've done in, in uh, just three years, I have no doubt that we can be part of this adventure. 2050, we'll probably be on Mars. Maybe we need sooner than that. Yeah. Now, right. think about it. It's funny you mentioned Mars. Yeah. Are we willing to take risks on humans the same way we took risks sending initially monkeys to the moon or sending monkeys in space. Sorry, they didn't make it to the moon. They made it in space, right? And I think the first monkey, it was sent by Russians and uh, uh, it, it died. Uh, but so animals supported our crazy ideas, but then we were able to do better. Right. This is where we're at in biotech and pharma. And even if we go to space, uh, Hey, maybe our next model will be called Space Skin. Yeah. <laughs> and we can test on our models what happens to a human being that's injected on a three-year uh, trip to Mars. That's that's not a that's not a bad idea. I'm not throwing a crazy idea out. It's would you no. take the risk on a human being or would you test it out on one of our models? No, z zero gravity research is uh, like up and coming field. Yeah. So maybe Geno Skin has one zero gravity. Yeah. Space skin. There we go. Space skin. Love it. Great. So what is the future for Genoskin? Let's say. In, in well, five... now we just determined it. The future for, for Genoskin is continuing to um, add on to what we have today to okay. build really uh, a, uh, a family of platforms which enables researchers to de-risk as much as possible moving into clinical. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've been able to grow to the point we're at in 10 years uh, by bootstrapping it and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, doing non-dilutive funding grants and, and, uh, and uh, similar things in, in Europe as well. And so for us to continue the expansion at an even faster pace, we will be opening up our capital. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a different, it's not quite just an idea thrown on a, on a napkin. And, uh, you see some VCs at the, in Kendall square and in, in Boston and you say, I've got this idea. Let's do it. We've been doing the proof of concept for 10 years. It works. We've built a company with 45 employees, two sites around the world, profitable. So the story we have to bring to investors is slightly different. Yeah. But and if we want to change the world, it's going to take some cash. 100%, 100%, others cash. Right? What we need to do is to further automate what we're doing, right? We're doing it still in a very manual way. Hey, I even go back to the lab sometimes. Yeah, so I always say COVID made us realize that we cannot 
rely on the real world completely. We need digital replica of all of our workflows, all the things we do. We should be able to monitor things remotely. And that's and what you do. <laughs> the marketing of my platform, but yes, so I think it is very important we create digital workflows and automate all the administrative things so we can move fast. Absolutely, absolutely. Because if, if we don't do it, other people will, um, because I said, we can't be the only company. So right. we can be one of the companies and we can be the lead. Um, there will be other companies. And so that's why the, our next step will be opening up the capital. Very cool. I think what you are it, doing- It'll be in the latter part of this year. Love it, love it. I think what you are doing is very inspiring. And thank you. You're creating the cruelty-free world. More importantly, uh, you're helping bring better cures to market faster. Yeah. So I think it's really, really impressive. And I love your positioning too. So there are two sides, right? You are uh, one side, you're making whole drug discovery more ethical. On the other side, you're making more clinical trial more efficient, right? So I mean, there's a lot of money at stake, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and, and savings for the, the industry. So if you can do it faster, it means that the cost of developing a drug will be lower. It means that the drugs should be more affordable. Right. Uh, affordable. It's, it's a full cycle. And whether you or whether one likes what we do or, or believes in what Genoskin does because we're an alternative to animal testing or they believe in what we do because we can bring their drug faster to market, we're not a judge on how people uh, see us, but right. there are multiple ways of seeing what we do. What we know we're doing is changing the world. I don't argue that. I think that's 100%. Eric, pleasure talking to you. It was fun. Likewise. Thank you I very talk. much. Bye. Bye-bye.